Face at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. The city of San Antonio looking to stretch a popular rent assistance program out a little bit longer. Yeah, the emergency housing assistance program has approved $64.8 million to help struggling families pay rent and other bills. Our Garrett Bernger tells us about the money that's coming in as well as the need that could be coming up. The city's portion of coronavirus relief funds from the CARES Act will soon be spent in time for a December 30th deadline. Uh, we're right at 92.9% of 270 million. Between this and other funding sources, the city has spent more than $322 million responding to COVID-19. One of the most high profile uses of that money is the emergency housing assistance program. Now we are seeing an uptick, but we're also seeing a lot of individuals who've either already applied for three months and they're not eligible or they're getting that third month and the $500 cash stipend and then we're referring them to other services. In addition to what it already has for the program, the city's getting another $3.6 million through the state, enough to take EHAP through early or mid-February. And staff want to use $4.6 million from another block of federal funding to stretch it further. And that'll get us to most likely early March. An eviction moratorium is supposed to expire at the end of the month. Those city staff believe Congress may act to extend it through January and may pass $25 billion for rental assistance. We think that it will be doled out in a sim similar formula as CDBG funding and that communities will have the opportunity to use it as needed. District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino, though, noted federal dollars come with strings. We need more general fund dollars so that we can dictate uh, the, the, the way it is distributed so that we can help people in the way they need the help. And the need is certainly there. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Baptist Health System here in San Antonio began administering COVID-19 vaccines today. This was the first of two injections that those on the front line will receive. Many healthcare workers are hoping that the vaccine will provide another layer of protection in the fight against the coronavirus. We'll take it in the arm and move forward and hope it protects everyone. I felt great. I mean, uh, it's been plotting that way for the last several weeks, so it certainly wasn't a surprise. The vaccine has looked great. The health system is actually expected to receive a total of 3,900 doses of the vaccine this week. During what the governor called an extraordinary day, Greg Abbott outlined his plan for the distribution of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. The governor predicted that by month's end, a million Texans will be vaccinated. Paul Venema takes us to Abbott's mid-morning Austin News Conference. The governor discussed vaccine distribution at the UPS Distribution Center. They will be the state's primary distribution partner for the vaccine in what Governor Abbott described as the beginning to restore normalcy. We have more than 7,000 providers that are lined up prepared to uh, distribute this uh, once they receive the medicine from UPS. He said that 224,000 doses will have arrived at Texas hospitals by tomorrow. First doses will be given frontline workers like doctors and nurses. They'll be followed by the elderly. And that includes especially those who are in nursing homes, who are seniors, especially those who may have comorbidities or other types of health care issues. Governor Abbott said that keeping schools open, too, is a concern. I urge and hope uh, that teachers will be uh, near the front of the line in receiving this vaccine. The governor also urged greater use of drugs like Regeneron. These are life-saving antibody therapeutic drugs that can be uh, put into people who already have COVID-19 and help them recover and help keep them out of hospitals. The governor said he's not yet personally been given the vaccine, but that he will at what he called the appropriate time. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. The second vaccine to go before an expert panel has been backed for emergency approval by the Federal Drug Administration, which is reportedly expected to happen quickly with millions of doses ready to roll out once that happens. The FDA says it expects the emergency use authorization process to be faster than it was for the Pfizer vaccine last week. Both vaccines use a new approach involving genetic material. Both show to be about 95% effective in preventing the disease, and they've been tested on thousands of volunteers. A new episode of KSAT Explains is out right now and all focused on the biggest questions surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines, how they work, how they were developed so fast, and the safety of these vaccines. Plus, what we know about clinical trials, including children, and just what it will take 
for this pandemic to finally come to an end. You can watch this new episode on demand on ksat.com slash explains, or you can stream it on the KSAT TV app. An overnight fire on the west side appears to have been sparked by some heated words. San Antonio fire investigators are looking for the man who they believe set the fire to the home in the 600 block of San Joaquin. As Katrina Weber reports, that fire also caused the death of a pet. Firefighters take a deliberate approach to putting out a fire which they believe someone intentionally set. They say a couple who lived in this home in the 600 block of South San Joaquin had some heated words, an argument which boiled over. At some point after that, they say the man purposely started the fire. When firefighters arrived shortly after midnight, it was still going, but the man was gone. They say the woman got out safely, but one of their dogs died. Firefighters say it looks like the fire was set at the back of the house. And if you look, that's where most of the damage appears to be. Although it does seem that smoke spread throughout the house. Part of the siding appeared to almost melt away, indicating the heat had to be intense. Arson investigators have not said yet what was used to start the fire, only that they strongly suspect this was no accident. When the man is found, he could face a charge of arson. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. We're still waiting to learn the name of the man hit and killed by an SUV on the city's east side. It happened last night just before 8 o'clock. Now, according to police, the man was running on the main lanes of I-35 near the AT&T Center when he was hit. Officers say that the driver of the SUV was not able to avoid the victim, then hit a guardrail and ended up on the access road. The 47-year-old victim died at the scene, and that driver in this accident not expected to face any charges. In time saver traffic now, let's take a look at the TransGuide camera here at 281 South at the quarry. This is the direction uh, this camera is facing. You can see those flares there, the flashing lights. Uh, word is we've got a disabled vehicle that's off to the side of the road there, certainly causing some backup in the southbound lanes, although traffic heading north looks heavy as well. More local businesses trying to make sure that people are taken care of during this pandemic. Today, the R Family Medical Group hosted a food distribution for seniors. Seniors drove up, had their trunks loaded with canned goods, produce, meat and milk. Organizers say last month they had to turn people away during a food distribution event. That's why this time they collected 900 boxes of food to make sure that no one was left behind. We're really happy to give back to, to the community, especially during uh, the holidays. And of course, through, during this pandemic, a lot of people have lost their, their jobs. So um, this is a more, even more important now. Castro Community Insurance Agency also sponsored the event. Employees from both businesses volunteered today. All right, taking a live look at live ah. cam at 607. I'm sorry, I had to rub my eyes a little. It's, it's a blurry picture, but I think what it is going looks on? pretty nice. Yeah, it is. That I happens think. sometimes at sunset where the, the autofocus does it. One of the things with the live cam. All hey, right. this, one, the, this one looks good, though, right there. 31 degrees. That's how we started the day. We made it up to 61 by the afternoon. So all day temperatures were below average. Right now we're clear 54 degrees. Dew point at 27. The dew point's one of the key elements that's going to be changing into tomorrow. Already a southeasterly breeze at 8. That's important because it's coming off the Gulf of Mexico. It's going to add a little moisture to our air, and that's going to lead to some noticeable changes tomorrow. Looking at temperatures across the state, by and large, 50, some locations still in the 60s, including Del Rio 62, we're 64 Laredo and Brownsville at 61. But locally, San Antonio at 54, and for the most part, we're low to mid 50s, uh, closer to 60 as you get near the Rio Grande. So this evening, clear sky, not much of a breeze out there, just southeasterly at about two to eight miles per hour. Temperatures falling down into the 40s, then upper 30s. So a chill in the air, but I'm expecting us to be above freezing tomorrow morning. Even the majority of the hill country above freezing, just barely. Low clouds quickly developing with that added moisture in the air tomorrow. A little hint of humidity by the afternoon. Still comfortable at 64, but it's going to get damp and drizzly around this time tomorrow. A few sprinkles, some areas of drizzle. Aquifer up a little bit today, but we're still seven feet below or almost seven feet below the December average. And actually, Mountain Cedar not reported today. 
it says low there, but really it's not not non-existent in our pollen count. We just have mold reported in today's pollen counts. We'll be back to talk about the dampness for tomorrow, how much rain we could actually see across various parts of South Texas and a few cold fronts that will be affecting us coming right up. This essay salutes holiday greeting is brought to you by CPS Energy. Hello, my name is Veronica Gutierrez with CPS Energy, and I want to say happy holidays and thank you to our first responders and veterans. I would like to take a moment and send a special thank you to my wonderful husband, Ruben, who is a San Antonio firefighter and a veteran. Thank you for all you've done and all you do to continue to support our country, our, communi our community, and our family. I love you and stay safe. All right, we are just moments away from the daily briefing, but before we get to that, we want to welcome Myra back from quarantine. It's so good to see you back here on the set. Yeah, doing thank well. you. Obviously, I've been out of the studio uh, for the last two weeks or so. My family was in quarantine and I've you know, kept people updated on social media and as well as our website. And we're very fortunate to be healthy. Yeah. I've tested negative, um, no symptoms at my house. So yeah. I'm feeling incredibly blessed for that. But meantime, we saw nearly 1,400 new cases of COVID-19 reported yesterday here in our area. So let's go now uh, to city and county leaders to see what the count is for today. Dr. Colleen Bridger, who is our assistant city manager and COVID-19 incident commander. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we are reporting yet another high case count, very high in fact, 1,606 new COVID-19 cases since yesterday. This has pushed us to 99,142 total cases in our community since the pandemic began. Our seven-day moving average has climbed again to 1,100. Unfortunately, there are no due deaths to report tonight, but we know we have lost a number of our loved ones and neighbors and family members, so please keep them and their survivors in your prayers this evening. Unfortunately, local hospitalizations, however, do continue to rise. We have 837 patients in the hospital tonight, which is up 11 from yesterday. We also have 109, excuse me, 104 COVID-19 related admissions since yesterday. Again, that marks three days in a row with very, very high admissions in the 24 hour period. We have 272 patients in the ICU and 134 are on ventilators with COVID-19. Available hospital beds are sta that are staffed by a nurse are hovering right at, at around 10%. And so we want to remind you as we head into the Christmas and New Year's holidays, we all share a personal responsibility to do our part to eliminate this virus. It's critical that we wear masks and we practice social distancing. Please also avoid social gatherings, especially with those who are outside your household. And if you are sick, stay home. We're in the middle of a COVID-19 surge and we can't let our guard down just because the first batch of vaccines have been made available. If you need help finding COVID-19 ser services or resources or testing site locations, please call 311 or visit covid19.sanantonio.gov. Let me turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great, thank you, Mayor. As, as you mentioned, uh, you know, some troubling trends here with the numbers. Uh, you know, we, we kind of tend to look at two different ones, that seven day uh, moving average, which I think is maybe either at an all time high at 1100 or close to it, at least since the uh, summer spike. So that's alarming. And of course, as you mentioned, the hospital numbers do not look good. Uh, we need to continue to, uh, again, heed the warnings of our healthcare professionals, uh, make sure we're wearing our masks, face coverings, make sure you're uh, avoiding the large gatherings, particularly during the holiday season. I know we're all tempted uh, to, to get together with family and friends as we end the year, um, but we want to avoid that at all possible. And of course, um, the general hygiene in washing hands. Uh, last uh, bit of good news I will share. I did t uh, speak with George Hernandez over at the Bear County Hospital UHS uh, earlier today. Um, they re did receive a, a shipment this morning at 1015 of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, about 7,000 doses, of course. Uh, these are being distributed in tiers starting tomorrow, not for the public yet, so just uh, uh, be, continue to be patient and, again, uh, precautionary. But 7,000 doses, this is at UHS. I know we've got several other hospitals, uh, but they're going to be going to the Tier 1 population, those first responders, nurses, doctors who are treating uh, those um, who are infected or may be infected. So a little bit of hope on the horizon, but I think we wanna make sure we continue uh, to hunker down and be safe, take care of yourself and those around you. Thank you, Mayor. Great, thank you, uh, Commissioner. 
Uh, and I do want to report that today at our city council meeting, we did make additional funds available for our emergency housing assistance program. So if you are struggling through this pandemic and you're having a, a tough time paying rent or mortgage, please know there is assistance available for you. You can get information about our emergency. More than 1,600 new cases of COVID-19 reported today, 1,606 to be exact. And that seven day rolling average, that's that number that we're told to look at to give us the best picture of where we are. It's incredibly high. Yeah. 1100 cases on average per 24 hours. And right now we know that there are 837 patients hospitalized. 272 are in the ICU and we have 134 patients on ventilators. Commissioner Rodriguez calling this a troubling trend. And as we head into the holidays, Christmas and New Year's, of course, they're warning everyone to take heed to the warnings that we've been mentioning all along. And I do want to say on a, on a personal note, I went to two of the city testing sites to get tested for COVID. It was very easy. Yeah. So if somebody out there has some trepidation or nervousness about doing that, it was quick. It was easy. You set up an appointment. You can get it done uh, definitely for your own sake as well as those around you. And also we mentioned earlier today that there is a new at home test that can be administered. We have details about that on KSAT.com. All right, let's turn now to the weather out there. 54 degrees and really felt like a nice fall. Are we still in fall at this point? We are it technically feels like winter. Well, astronomical fall, meteorological winter. I ah, love to confuse everybody. That's yes. the only reason I'm saying this. <laughs> okay. Because to keep weather records, uh, we just do December, January, February as winter to meteorologists and the science of meteorology, but astronomy it comes down to Monday at about 4 a.m. That's when it'll be, that's when we'll have the winter solstice. Producer Bill is so glad I'm back and here to ask those questions. <laughs> and the clock, the time's just ticking away, <laughs> and he ticking is away. At his watch. <laughs> How much time left, Bill? <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's take a look at our future cast. See, we could go on and on and on. All right, a clear sky tonight, quiet across the entire state. It's going to stay quiet tomorrow, but you'll notice changes. After sunrise, low clouds start to fill in. Then by sunset tomorrow, we have a little bit of drizzle and a few sprinkles that will develop across South Texas. And so we'll have overall dampness starting around this time tomorrow, lasting into the very first part of Saturday. And I do think we could actually squeeze out a few showers, ring out a few showers as a cold front moves in very early Saturday morning. The rainfall potential, though, is largely a few hundredths of an inch, though you get into northern Bear County and especially east of San Antonio, you could have a tenth to a quarter of an inch of rain. OK, that's the potential there within some of the showers that develop temperatures right now. We're in the 50s, starting to dip down into the 40s. Bulverde at 49, for example, and tomorrow morning it's going to be cool again in the 30s, but 30s above freezing and then cloudy in 64 with those late days, sprinkles and areas of drizzle. And then this weekend, by and large, sunny right near 70. And yes, the winter solstice, clear sky, 70 degrees. All right, official winter. Thank you, Adam. And uh, Larry, we have a lot to talk about in sports. Spurs playing tonight. What's going on? Yeah, Spurs will uh, get their final tune-up of the preseason before they start the real games next Wednesday on the road. And tonight is another chance for the Spurs to not only see what the rookies can do, but just the entire team. And in high school football, the Brooks brothers came up big for Shiner in the state championship game. Coming up. Our three game preseason schedule tonight at the Houston Rockets. It's one more chance for the young guys like rookie Devin Vassell to get ready for the real games and another shot to evaluate the entire team. But this is really obviously rebuilding from last year and what we've done in the bu in the bubble. So um, you know over the short preseason training camp that, that we've had, I think we, we've done a decent job. Um, you know, again, it's all about learning and learning on the fly, which, which is a, you know, not the easiest thing to do. Um, but in these circumstances, it, it's what's needed of us. So look, we're, we're in a good spot, I think, and it's just about um, continuing to, to, to build. Rockets host the Spurs tonight at 7. Highlights on the night beat. 
the Shiner Comanches face the post Antelopes at AT&T Stadium for the Class 2A Division I state title today. First quarter, post quarterback Slayton Pittman rolls to his right, has nowhere to run or pass, so he cuts back. Bad choice because Shiner's Doug Brooks strips the ball, catching the fumble in the air. He runs it back and hands it off to Max. Match a sec for a Shiner touchdown, and the Comanches strike first 7 to nothing. Incredible play. They led 21-20 in halftime. Third quarter, same score. Post punting when number one, Doug Brooks blocks the kick and then recovers it himself in the end zone for a Shiner touchdown. Dude's a one-man wrecking crew, and it's 28-20 Shiner. They reviewed the play, touchdown stands, and Shiner would roll from there, winning the third state championship 42-20. Doug Brooks won defensive player of the game, you can see why, and his younger brother Dalton won offensive MVP. It's a once-in-a-lifetime moment. We went out there, we played with our hearts, we played for our team, and we came out great. Stiff arm of the game also goes to Doug Brooks. Fourth quarter, he destroys number 15, Brennan Riker, and then hands out another stiff arm on his way for a 30-yard gain. Riker had no shot, just nasty. Doug is a junior, and his brother Dalton a sophomore. Look at that. Wow. Very talented on both sides of the ball. The Southside Cardinals will play Corpus Christi Flower Bluff in the second round of Class 5A Division II playoffs tonight. Both teams are 9-1, but Southside had four games forfeited due to COVID-19, including their only loss. On the field, they're 6-0 and opened the playoffs by shutting out Jefferson Mustangs 52-0. Southside linebacker and Wyoming commit Micah Young told us yesterday at his signing the shorter week is different, but the cards are ready to go. It's been short, because, especially because we play on Thursday. We usually play on Friday. Uh, we didn't get that, that many practice, but we got as many rests as we could, and we're ready. We're locked in. Southside and CC Flower Bluff will kick tonight at 7 at Alamo Stadium. And it's an exciting time for Brennan Bears defensive back Donovan Drayton because the Bears are getting ready for a playoff matchup. And yesterday, he signed with the University of the Incarnate Word. Originally, he committed to Louisiana Monroe, but after coaching changes there, he decommitted and picked UIW, which will now allow him to play in front of family and his friends. It was a big reason why I decided UIW would be the, the best place for me. It would be home for me because it is home for me. And it would allow my parents and so my, my, all my family to come see me and come play and, and try to be great. Brennan will face Edinburgh Vela in the second round of Class 6A Division II playoffs tomorrow night at 7 at Buccaneer Stadium in Corpus. Guys. All right. Thank you, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. Time now for our KSAT Q&A, and as we are most Thursdays, we are joined by Dr. Ruth Berggren, an infectious disease specialist with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Berggren, thank you for being here. Uh, let's first talk about you. How are you doing? Because we know that you received the COVID-19 vaccine a couple of days ago. Tell us about that. Well, I'm, I'm so thankful and I'm so happy. And as you can see, I still look like me. I don't have spike proteins growing out of my head. I haven't turned green. Um, so I, it was, it was really a, a relief to get this show on the road, uh, to be, to, and not just me, but others as well. And it was a little more, um, of a reaction than I normally get for my flu shot. I want to be honest with everybody. Um, my, I got it in my left deltoid and my arm was a little sore that evening and it was sore yesterday. Today, I can't even say that it's sore. Um, in addition to that, I felt fatigue and, but it wasn't the kind of fatigue that would make me take a day off from work and maybe a little achy. Um, and this is what I'm hearing also. Uh, it's what I'm reading in the medical literature that this vaccine is slightly more reactogenic than the flu shot. Um, and younger people are going to have more reactions than older people. But it's I've been through it and I'm here to tell you it's not scary. All right, Dr. Bergren, and uh, you took that Pfizer vaccine in front of a crowd there at UT Health, but soon the Pfizer vaccine won't be the only one available to people. We understand the Moderna vaccine is getting ready to uh, roll out. That's right. The Moderna vaccine hearings with FDA happened today. I was able to listen in to just a few of those segments because it was a rather busy day for me. But it looks like um, the FDA will vote to approve that. I don't think there's going to be much discussion. And this means that very shortly we'll have more vaccines 
coming available and we'll be able to expand the populations that are getting vaccinated. The other good thing about Moderna is that it's it still requires cold storage, but it's slightly less stringent than the Pfizer. So it makes it a little bit easier for smaller clinical areas that may not be well equipped with large minus 80 freezers. Those places will have an easier time getting people signed up and vaccinated. So this is really great news. Do we know exactly what these vaccines are intended to do? Because I know there's been some question about, okay, does the vaccine prevent infection or does it also prevent the spread? Do we have a clear answer yet? Uh, the, the question about spread is not clear. And there was a lot of discussion about that today. And it's going to be a while before we really get that answer. Um, what we do know with confidence is that it these vaccines definitely decrease the number of symptomatic infections, um, 95, 94.5% efficacy when you compare the vaccine to the placebo. So it's going to prevent people from getting sick. It's going to certainly prevent people, you know, the sick people from going to the hospital and having bad outcomes. But it is possible that you could get the vaccine, Myra or Devin, and that you could subsequently get infected but not notice it and then you might be able to spread it to other people. Now, we, this is one of the reasons why we can't all just take off our masks, which is what we're dying to do. I'm dying to take my mask off. Um, but we'll have to wear our masks until we have more of this kind of information. If it turns out that you can still transmit virus to somebody even when you've been vaccinated, that doesn't mean we failed. Our goal is what? It's to save lives, right? So the vaccine is life-saving, but it may not be the kind of immunity that prevents you from getting infected at all. It may be the kind of immunity that prevents you from getting a symptomatic case. And Dr. Bergen, we know that by the spring, the public is expected to all be able to get the vaccine, but do we know how frequently we're gonna to have to take this vaccine? Is it a yearly thing? Is it every few years? Is it too early to tell right now? Too early to tell, Devin. Um, what we do know is that there will be, for these mRNA vaccines made by Pfizer and Moderna, you'll need to get two shots. And the Pfizer is a three-week interval, and the Moderna is a four-week interval. So you're definitely in for two shots if you're getting one of those. And whether or not you have to have it in a year or two or three years, it is way too early to say. What I'm hoping for is that uh, we'll get at least a year of immunity out of it, and you know, if we're lucky, two to three. But um, you know what? If I'm asked to get it again in a year, to be sure, I'll, I'll sign up and get it again. Let's talk about the updated guidelines on quarantining from the CDC. You know that I am just out of my own quarantine. Uh, you were kind enough to help me answer some questions through that. So I want to publicly say thank you for your generosity in doing that. So awesome. I'm so glad you're back. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be back for sure and feeling good. Uh, what should people do at this point? What is what is the direction as it stands right now on when you should quarantine and at what point? Okay, so when you should quarantine hasn't changed is if you've had a significant exposure, which is that exposure of being unmasked within six feet of somebody else that's infected for cumulatively 15 minutes, it doesn't have to be 15 minutes all at a stretch, that is a significant exposure, then you should quarantine, absolutely. And previously the CDC said something real simple, quarantine equals 14 days. Now, they've anybody can find this. So if, if you don't remember what I'm about to say, I want everybody to know you just go to the CDC.gov website and uh, search for quarantine guidelines. It'll pop up. This is in the public domain. But basically, if you have if you're going to do this without testing, the quarantine period is 10 days. If you actually have access to a test, then you can quarantine for seven days, but you have to make sure that that test that you get is negative and it has to be within 48 hours of ending your quarantine. And you cannot use the negative test to come back sooner than seven days. You can use your negative test to come back after seven days. Okay. So you got it. It's now a 10 day quarantine if you have no test and it's a seven day quarantine if you do have a test.
Okay, so here was some of my confusion in my own quarantine. What if you live with the person who has been infected? You don't have a one-time exposure to them. So you are with them several hours a day, day after day after day. You may not be having symptoms right then. So if you do develop symptoms or you do test positive in that instance, when should your quarantine begin? Okay. If you develop symptoms or you test positive, you're no longer in quarantine, Myra. This is no longer called quarantine. It's called you're a sick person and you're isolating. It's called isolation. Okay. So now you follow the rules of isolation, which are 10 days from the day you got symptoms. And if you're better and you've had no fever for 24 hours without taking acetaminophen or ibuprofen, then you can go back to work after 10 days of isolation. Okay, right. so there is a difference in quarantine versus isolation, something to remember. Right. Dr. Ruth Quarantine. Bergeron. Sorry. Well, no, don't apologize at all. We are always eager to hear as much information as you are willing to share. So thanks as always for your time and we'll be talking with you again soon. All right, have a good evening. Take care, you, you as well. We'll be right back. A baby rhino from the Cincinnati Zoo is lighting up the internet, having the time of his life on a rainy day. This little guy is named Johnny Joe. <laughs> and while that way less fun grown up rhino over there is heading for somewhere drier, a Johnny Joe is ready to run, jumping and splashing in the mud. This looks so familiar. When he <laughs> slips, he gets right back up and keeps on going. According to the Cincinnati Zoo, mud protects rhino's skin from the sun and insects. Uh, okay. How about that? I can see that. So, Mom, he is doing something good for his health. <laughs> According to baby rhinos, mud is fun to stomp around in as well. And human babies. I was gonna say, kids will be kids no matter yeah, what. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, look outside right now. That camera's much more in focus. How was the forecast for you, Adam? Yeah, it looks like we'll get a little damp by this time tomorrow. Uh, this evening, though, is going to be clear. Clear sky. We're 54 degrees now, down to 40 at 11 p.m. And then tomorrow morning will be in the upper 30s for most of us. So just a little above freezing by early tomorrow morning. We're going to talk about that dampness and even some cold fronts that will be affecting us coming right up. All right, it is cold outside, but nothing like what we're seeing up there in the northeast. No snow, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. just chilly, cool temperatures. I like looking at those pictures, but <laughs> from here in yeah. South Texas. See, they traumatize me. Bring me back to childhood. Memories, yeah, right, Devin? Yeah, you experience that, right? <laughs> yes. Memories. Yeah, they were measuring it with yardsticks uh, up Ooh. north in parts of New England, especially upstate New York area. Around here, we're just trying to get some moisture. We would like some, but it's hard for us to muster up any. All right, let's take a look at the weather pattern out there and you can see a little bit of leftover snow in parts of New England and even the Great Lakes and also over the Rocky Mountains. We have a little disturbance that's moving in and that disturbance is going to spin up a little cold front that's going to hit us by early Saturday, but don't expect any big changes from that cold front uh, Pacific front coming in. Not a big deal. So our weather pattern right now, we've had this bump in the upper level flow. So another sunny day today, but that changes into tomorrow. We're quiet right now and it's not going to get active tomorrow, but there will be noticeable changes that will be affecting your Friday evening and even Saturday morning. First of all, the clouds start to really fill in tomorrow morning after sunrise. We'll start to see the gray sky take over and then that's going to lead to some areas of drizzle and a few sprinkles here and there by about this time tomorrow and through tomorrow night on into early Saturday. Also, as the cold front starts to drop in Saturday morning, we'll probably squeeze out a few actual showers from those clouds. So some areas of light to moderate rain, but not everybody's going to see that. OK, the drizzle is going to be more common than the actual hit or miss showers. And most of the real rain activity is going to be east of San Antonio. And the actual rainfall potential here, I think, really tops out at a quarter of an inch. So even high end potentials aren't looking all that impressive, uh, mainly a trace south and west of San Antonio, maybe a tenth to a quarter of an inch east of I-35 and especially between I-37 and I-10. And even north of town, we could have some higher accumulations up to a quarter of an inch. But Bear County, we could see anything from a trace to maybe that tenth or two tenths of an inch. So we're not looking at a drought denting rain here, but better 
than nothing, and at least there's some potential, mainly just dampness to end Friday and start Saturday. Temperatures, let's talk about them. 54 right now, and the dew points at 27. The dew point's important here because we have that very dry air, but here's our future cast for the dew point. As we go through the night, this wind off the Gulf of Mexico, especially through the day tomorrow, is going to help raise those dew point numbers. So that means an influx of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, a hint of humidity in the air, relative to what we've had, and that's going to really help those low clouds develop into areas of drizzle and even some fog. So it's that influx of humidity and that hint of mugginess in the air by this time tomorrow. 57 now Castorville, 50 Bulverde, down to 43 Bernie area, 52 New Braunfels and Canyon Lake. You're at 57, already 46 in Kerrville, but Del Rio still in the low 60s. Tomorrow morning, most of us upper 30s. 36 in Hondo, 38 San Antonio, 39 Pleasant, and even some lower 40s south of town. And I think we'll be just barely above freezing in most of the hill country. Then we get into tomorrow afternoon, despite the low clouds, pretty comfortable. 64 degrees for the high. Then around and especially after sunset, the low clouds start to really drop a drizzle here and there and give us some dampness. But a few showers really amounting to, again, a tenth or two tenths of an inch. Friday night through early Saturday, most of the weekend is looking sunny. So yeah, maybe a little damp tomorrow morning when you wake up on Saturday. Otherwise, we're looking sunny and comfortable. So that cold front hits early Saturday. Notice it doesn't change our temperatures all that much. We'll still have highs upper 60s over the weekend and then into early next week, clear skies and right near 70 degrees. And we could actually have a stronger cold front hit us on Wednesday and that could really have an impact on our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day dropping those temperatures. Not going to provide a white Christmas, <laughs> but a cooler Christmas. I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know what I'm okay with? I know what you are. You're yeah, cool. you do. <laughs> okay. Therm Thursday. I'm more than okay <laughs> with giving away another homemade thermometer ornament. I have been cranking these out. Last night I worked on thermometer number 109 because I'm still just Ooh. making them to keep giving wow. them away. I keep them in my car, so if I run into people, yeah, here you go, I have one. All right, there you go. <laughs> All right, so here's another one. Thermometer ornament winner, Donna Highbaugh of San Antonio. Congratulations, I just sent you the email with the instructions of what we do here on out. You can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter that drawing. I'm giving away more tomorrow and then even into next week, I'll be here through the 23rd. So enter and I'll be picking winners as many as I possibly can fit in here. More to come. All the right, spirit thanks, of giving. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be right back with In Case You Missed It. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It is Thursday, December 17th. The FDA advisory committee is giving their endorsement for the Moderna vaccine. Yeah, this could mean that the U.S. will soon have two COVID-19 vaccines on the market. When asked if the benefits outweigh the risks for people 18 years old and older, with 20 people voting yes and only one abstaining from the vote. It is likely the FDA will accept the recommendation, then it can move on to an advisory committee at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention before getting approved. An argument leads to a house fire on the west side overnight. According to the incident commander, a man and woman got into a fight in the 600 block of South San Joaquin just after midnight. And at some point, they say the boyfriend caught the back of the house on fire. Everyone except a dog was able to make it out safely. The man ran off and has not been detained by police yet. Arson investigators are still looking into the incident. For the fourth time in the past five weeks, first time unemployment claims have increased. Last week, 885,000 claims were filed. That's more than the 800,000 claims that economists expected. Meanwhile, continuing claims, which track the total number of Americans seeking jobless benefits, fell to five and a half million. The latest figures are adjusted for seasonal factors. Thanks to the Salvation Army and members in the community, more than 6,500 area kids will have a present under the tree. It's all part of their Angel Tree program. Donated toys and clothes were picked up by families today. The distribution moved to the parking lot for a drive through to accommodate social distancing guidelines. Organizers are just glad to continue the tradition.
Papa John's is looking to take a bigger slice of the pizza business by rolling out stuffed crust pizza. Starting on Monday, it'll only be available for members of Papa John's customer rewards program. Then non-members can begin ordering it on December 28th. Now, this is the only the second time that the chain has changed its crust in its 35 year history. I thought for sure this was already a thing. Apparently I thought so not. Too. It's on Pizza Jones. Hut has stuff. That's crust. right. <laughs> Last year, Papa John's released garlic Parmesan crust. Pizza's popularity has reached new heights in 2020, as you might expect. So many more of us staying home. It's prompted a pizza rivalry between companies. Papa John's, Domino's, Pizza Hut, even Panera Bread launched marketing campaigns to cash in on the pizza frenzy. Panera bread. Come on. Now. I mean, <laughs> all right. Taylor Swift isn't the only one working on new music during the pandemic. A couple of former Beatles have been working on new music. Also, Ringo Starr recorded an album of his own at his studio home at his home in his studio. Uh, the album is titled Zoom In and it's going to drop in March. It features five songs and contributions from Paul McCartney, Dave Grohl and Phineas. Zoom in, that seems pretty appropriate for, <laughs> for all of us this year. One of the songs was released this week. It's called Here's to the Nights. He worked on that one with song or, songwriter rather, Diane Warren. Former Beatle Paul McCartney also having a new album drop on Friday. He recorded it in isolation as well. It's titled McCartney 3 and features him on every instrument and every single vocal. Nice. Thanks for watching the News at 6. All right, we'll see you back here for the night. Have a good evening.